Claire, these LA5s have been grabbing everyone's attention over the last few days. Can you talk a little bit about, first of all, what's caused these fires and, and why they're moving so fast? And secondly, as we're about a week in now, what, what's the current situation? Well, what's caused the fires are a mixture of factors. So the weather conditions, about a week ago, they were warning of very strong winds, which materialized around Tuesday, Wednesday. And these very strong Santa Ana winds, they're known for blowing very dry air through California, through Southern California in particular in the wintertime. That combined with having already very dry vegetation in the region and also some factors that we don't know yet that sparked the fires beginning. Some ignition sources which are under investigation. It's not clear what actually started the fires, but there was lots of dry vegetation around and these very strong winds that blow in coming from the desert areas in the interior of the United States that bring very dry, hot air and very, very strong winds up to about 100 miles per hour. So a very severe, what they call Santa Ana winds event. You know, Tuesday warnings were put out that actually the winds themselves could be causing structural damage. The winds were so strong. So what we saw then, outbreak of a couple of fires, three or four fires, two of them particularly grew particularly rapidly to become very large, the Palisades fire and the Eaton fire broke out then on Tuesday and Wednesday and spread for several days. It's really only over the weekend that the firefighters have been able to start to get them under control because the winds have dropped. As of Monday, when we're recording this, Monday morning, the situation is that there's an estimated around about 12,000 or more structures burnt across these two major fires. What I would say in terms of the situation right now is that it's not over yet, potentially. The winds have dropped over the weekend, but there are forecasts for the winds to pick up again over the next few days. There have been a lot of fire support come in from other regions over the past few days. So the capacity of the firefighters has increased, but it's still quite potentially still an evolving event. And these fires seem much larger than anything else has happened, clearly in terms of the level of damage in Los Angeles, very significant. Should we be surprised about this or is this a factor related to some of the changes in the climate? It's not a surprise. I think lots of people who study wildfires recognize that this part of California is very prone to wildfires. One of the surprises is potentially the time of year that's happened. Typically, by now, there should have been some rain in Southern California. So the dry season being through the summer and then winter rain starting would wetten up the vegetation a bit. As we go into winter and then the Santa Ana winds are mostly a winter phenomena. So the two can overlap, but normally that overlap would be in October or November. So to have such severe fire conditions in January is unusual. Geographically, it's, it's a wildfire risk area for sure. And these communities that are being burnt, they're on the outskirts of LA. They're, they're housing divisions that have been built on that urban wild land interface where there is a lot of dry vegetation in the canyons that run down to these communities. So I think what happened this year is this combination of this drought that we've had this winter with the Santa Ana winds making it unusual to have these sorts of fires in January. And actually looking back a year, the previous winter was very, very wet. So Southern California, this time last year, was having a lot of rain. And there's certainly some speculation that that caused the vegetation last year to grow significantly. And then this year, it's dried out through the summer and there haven't been the winter rains this year to wet it back up. So there's a lot of dry fuel in the region on that wildland urban interface that's provided the fuel for these fires right now. What about insurance? I mean, there's been talk about companies withdrawing from providing cover in the US. You know, we know it's a complicated market in the US with rates generally. So what any sort of predictions of how this is going to impact the insurance market and that in talks of people not having insurance coverage because of the challenges of, of getting coverage at all? Yes, the insurance situation in the past couple of years in particular has been 
that insurers have been withdrawing coverage or changing their coverages, increasing deductible levels, affordability has been changing, and the coverage levels have been changing. And that's been due to a mix of risk changing and regulatory pressures and the cost of claims increasing generally in insurance over the past four to five years. Lots of complicated factors that go in, into that situation, particularly in the US insurance market. The regulators have literally just taken some steps to improve insurance coverage for wildfire in California specifically. And it was previously the case that homeowners' rates could only be set based on historical loss data. They've now just passed legislation that would enable catastrophe models to be used in the setting of rates and for cost of reinsurance to be calculated and factored into rates. So from an insurer's perspective, that would all make it more possible to provide coverage. Um, but these events, of course, are going to come at a time where there is pressure on the insurance availability and the insurance markets. We don't know yet what the cost is going to be. There are some numbers that have been put out there, 10 billion plus, potentially 20 billion. It's still really early, I think, to be making loss estimates. The event isn't over yet. Damage assessments have not been started. The area is totally locked down still. And how much is ended up being borne by the private insurance market, how much flows into the FAIR plan, which is the insurer of last resort plan, and how much flows into the reinsurance market, it's still very early to understand all of that in detail. But I think it's clear that insurance coverage going forwards will be a topic of a lot of um, discussion continued. What these fires will do will raise that topic and awareness of insurance coverage to the fore again. It already has. It's being widely discussed in the press and how the regulators and the industry work together to ensure ongoing coverage, whether that's through the private market or through the California state fair plan, how that plays out will we'll need to be seen after these events. Now, we're going to be talking about wildfire at our Exponential Risk event in March. And Claire, you've been great help in pulling that together. How do you think that's going to impact what we're going to be talking about? Are we going to have enough information by the beginning of March to sort of draw some conclusions from this? Yes, well, at the Exponential Risk Conference in March, we have got dedicated session to talk about wildfire modelling. We already had that planned on the agenda as it's been quite a hot topic for several years now. I think in terms of the modeling, the state of the modeling, it's a very complex peril to model. So models have been evolving in recent years very rapidly. And there's a lot of new providers that have been coming on that specialize in wildfire modeling. They're very complex events, as we've discussed, around the availability of the fuel sources, that interface between urban areas and wildlands, you know, the impact of, of strong winds and their direction and how strong they are, ignition sources, the ability of the firefighters to control the fires, even the impacts of your neighboring properties on your property risk. It's a very high resolution pool of peril and there's lots of complicated factors. So there's a lot of new solutions that we'll be talking about, about exponential risk. I think in terms of this event, it will still be quite early, actually. I mean, two months time, there may well by that time be estimates of how many properties will be damaged. But in terms of losses, I think there'll still be a lot of discussion. Business interruption, alternative living expenses costs are going to be very significant from this event. So beyond the structural damage, people will be out of their homes for a long time. So the policy conditions around BI and ALE will be very important. The reconstruction of these areas are going to take years and years and years for sure. So people are not going to be returning to their homes anytime soon. From a loss perspective, it will still be quite early, I think, in two months' time. And of course, the whole claim settlement process will take a long time for an event like this. There's likely to be significant post-event loss amplification. But as I said, that timeline of reconstruction after a wildfire like this is totally different than something like a hurricane. When you look back to some of the previous big fires that there've been, like the Paradise Fire in 2018, they've only partially rebuilt from that, and that's six years later. 
these communities get changed forever. So the claim settlement process, how much the properties have been insured for, whether they're insured for replacement cost values or actual cost values, it's going to take a long time to really get a firm firm loss estimate. Well, that was very helpful. Thank you very much for the latest updates. Thank you, Matthew, and look forward to discussing more in March.